Okay, before we get into our message this morning, uh, we want to have a word of prayer together, and so uh, let's bow our heads and our hearts together at this time. Father in heaven, we do thank you so very, very much for the Holy Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have uh, to rest from our labors from the week and to come together in songs of praise, to come together to uh, praise you, to pray to you, to ask for the sweetness of the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and minds, to learn from your Holy Word, and Lord, to be refreshed. And so we've gathered here today for those things. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out without measure into our hearts and minds. We pray for those on our prayer lists, those mentioned this morning, be very near to all. And may we be a light to those around us. Father, I pray that we have ears that will hear today. May our hearts be uh, prepared for this message. Uh, the question about temptation is one that's on the minds of a lot of people around the world. And so I pray that you give me the words to speak, that they may be your words, may be the truth, and that uh, will draw them closer to the cross. And Father, we, we thank you for Jesus, that most precious gift, who died for our sins, that we may have the opportunity of eternal life. And so we give Jesus our hearts today afresh and pray that what we think and say and do will bring glory to thee. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus, who's so worthy. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, I'm continuing in this series. The, the title of this series is The Sin Issue. And this particular uh, study here is, is entitled, Is Temptation a Sin? Is temptation a sin? And in order to answer this question in regard to temptation, uh, we must be educated in regard to the sin issue. That's what that's why we've been looking at these things. So I want to look at a summary of what we know about the sin issue, what we've learned about uh, the sin issue up to now. When defining sin. Uh, according to the Bible, according to God's Word, we find there's only one definition that's given in God's Word. And as I said before, you know, there are other scriptures that explain sin, um, but this one verse defines it. It defines it very clearly, and it's found in 1 John 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, that seems just straightforward, doesn't it? And that's the way God is about such things. Sin is the transgression of the law. And friends, that is the sole Bible definition of sin. Now, as we look deeper into the sin issue, we find an interesting statement uh, that we talked about. We find an interesting statement by the Lord that describes a bit more, really, about what John is saying there in this verse. And we found that statement in Exodus chapter 34. And when you read verses 5 to 7 in Exodus 34, it says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, speaking of Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by, him, by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. But notice verse 7 here. He says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And I want you to notice again what the Lord said in verse 7. He said, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So John gave us the overall definition of sin there in 1 John 3, 4. Transgression of the Ten Commandments, or literally what John is saying is that sin is lawlessness. And then we find these three words spoken here in Exodus 34. And so maybe you, you, know, you kind of scratch your head and go, hmm, is there a contradiction with what John said? 
Sin is lawlessness, right? That's what John said. Is there cut? No, there's no contradiction. These three words express different phases of sin. Iniquity is a thing done with evil intent. It's open rebellion. Evil intent. Uh, transgression is to pass over the bounds, is what it means. To go out of the way. And it can be done without evil intent. You're not intending to do it. Sin, that word sin signifies in its root idea to miss the mark. That is, to aim at the right mark, to do our best to hit the mark, and yet miss it by coming short of it. And that's the root idea in the original word defining sin. And at times it can uh, mean that it's been done ignorantly as well. But all three are sin based upon what John said there in 1 John 3, 4. But they're just different phases. And you can see this when you look at the Old Testament sanctuary offerings. You may wonder, you know, you're looking at why were there so many different offerings, offering for this, offering for that. Well, there were different offerings require, required based upon which of these three phases of sin were committed. If you sinned in a certain way that was ignorant, you brought that particular offering. If it was iniquity, it was open rebellion, and you've repented of it, you had a different offering, see? But ultimately, sin is aiming for the mark of God, but missing it by falling short of it. So unless there is a change in us, in our natural condition that we're born in, unless there's a change in us, we will never, friends, be saved, for we are yet in our sins and always falling short of God's mark of righteousness. And when the Bible speaks about this change, this change that's needed, this change that must take place, uh, in order for us to hit the mark of God's righteousness, is talking about a supernatural change that can only come from outside of ourselves. It can never, friends, come from within ourselves, as many deceivers today teach, even from the pulpit. This supernatural change can only come from the Creator of creation. You see, God has to change our heart, and He has to change our mind, and He has to change our desires and educate us in righteousness as all our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. So this change is from the supreme supernatural source, you could say, and it affects our heart and our mind. This is what the, bodies or the Bible tells us. And we have found this to be true because the Bible says that sin starts in our mind. And what we physically do in sinning is just the fruit of sin. The fruit of what started in our mind, see? And Jesus makes this very clear when he talked about lusting or, or murder as examples of sin starting in the mind. And, and so, friends, I hope that you can see just how important it is that we understand the sin issue. Because in order to see Jesus face to face at his second coming, we need to be in the spiritual condition that we, we read about in 2 Peter 3.14. And where Peter says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him, that's Jesus, in peace, without spot, and blameless. Without spot. That Greek word there means unblemished, undefiled, not spotted or dirty. So we need to understand the truth about this sin issue in order to uproot it from our life because when it comes to being in heaven and being there when Jesus returns and seeing him face to face, but being in heaven, Revelation twenty one twenty seven says, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And in order to uproot sin from our mind, we must know what it is. <laughs> right? And we must also know how to educate our conscience in order that our will then can make right choices to keep us from becoming defiled and unclean. And when we give our will to God, what happens? Our name is then written in that Lamb's Book of Life. But friends, uh, in order for it to remain 
in that book? We must continue to walk with Jesus, continue in his love. And when we do that, we will ever be climbing upward and hitting the mark of God, which is the righteous character of Christ. It's rather remarkable that God loves us so much that he's given us that opportunity. We should praise him. His praise should be on our lips all the time. And in this climb upward, we also learned everything depends upon the right action of our will. Every time we make a choice, we are either choosing uh, to do the will of God or our own selfish will. If we are to be saved, our choices must be the right choices. Those, you know, choices that please God. And the only way our choices will be the right ones is if we do as Jesus did. And we deny our will in favor of doing God's will. See? But in order for the will to make the right choice, it must know what is right. It must know what is right and what is wrong. And this is where our conscience comes into the picture. We talked about this the last time we were together. The conscience is that faculty of your mind that tells you to do good and not to do evil based upon moral truth. And that moral truth has a reference to the law of God. So we're right back to the law of God again, see. So your conscience tells you to do good and avoid evil, but you must be enlightened by the word of God so that you can truly understand the difference between good and evil and trust that truth that you found in God's word that that is the difference, see? If I abuse my conscience by doing something that I know is wrong or following any practice that is wrong, I'm in the process of hardening my heart. So if you want to have a sensitive conscience, you have to educate it. And not only must you educate it, you have to not violate your conscience, see, once it's been educated. The conscience will become hardened if it's violated over and over and over. And so our conscience advises our will, and then the will makes a choice. So friends, every time a person sins, they have given control of their conscience to someone other than God. It's either to yourself or to the powers of darkness. Selfishness, see. And if you allow somebody other than God to control your conscience, what's the ultimate result? The ultimate result is that you are going to be lost. Your name will be blotted out of the record, the Lamb's Book of Life. So in order to be able to stand on the right side in this final con conflict that we see coming up, friends, prophecy tells us, this conflict with the beast and his image and Mark and his name, you must be educating your conscience now with the word of God. And then you will receive righteous advice. Your will gets righteous advice from God's word, see. And then you can start making right, you know, right choices. And by making right choices, our heart becomes softened. It doesn't become hardened, see, because you're hitting the mark of God. And the goal is of reaching the point that you hit the mark of God every single time. Now, that's what we've learned so far in this series. Now, a question arises very often when I speak about the sin issue, and in particular, these truths about the will and, and, and uh, conscience and ed educating the conscience, and that question has to do with temptation. Namely, what is temptation and is it a sin? I want you to think about everything that we have covered in this series. And if you haven't heard any of the previous presentations, you can find them uh, a link to, to SoundCloud. You can listen to the audios. Um, last week's video is also on the church Facebook page and such. Um, or if, you know, get a hold of me and I can send you the link. Um, but I want you to think about everything we've covered in this series, and you should be able to come to a correct answer to that question. Is temptation a sin? However, many times people will still be 
somewhat confused maybe, and that may not be their fault. You see, because we have an enemy that doesn't want us to understand this issue. Because by having understanding in regard to the sin issue, we will know our need of a Savior and call upon Him for salvation, and that's not what the devil wants. In fact, I, I don't have the quote with me right now, but I shared a quote with you from, from the prophet who said, people people that we're witnessing to need to know what sin is and how to be saved from it. <laughs> and that's what prompted this, this series. You see, because we have an enemy that wants us dead. He wants us not only to be dead, but he wants us to be dead in our sins. And so I want to take some time here and look at this topic of uh, temptation. So we'll answer this question. Uh, we're, we're also going to look at the temptations of Jesus uh, in, in the coming study so that we'll have it very clear in our minds and by God's grace never fall for the tricks of the devil again, but instead trust wholeheartedly in Christ, you know, our Lord and Savior, that by His grace we're going to hit the mark of God every time because that's the goal. And the only way it's possible to hit the mark of God is with Jesus, you know, uh, living in our hearts and minds, having that change. But when considering this question, I want to go to James chapter 1. Because I want you to notice one of the most interesting, at least I find it interesting, one of the most interesting texts in the Bible. And it's found in James chapter 1, and it's verse 2. I remember when I was introduced to Christ. I was very young. Uh, I was in my uh, 20s. That seems like forever ago. And... Uh, uh, I read the Bible through. That was one of the first things I ever did. I read the Bible completely through. And I remember distinctly when I got to James, I thought, well, now this is interesting. <laughs> you know how, you know, memories, some memories are stronger than others and those, they stick with you. And, I, and every time I read James, uh, that pops into my head, that memory. But James 1 and verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. And you know, when you're first reading and you, and you haven't studied much of God's Word and you haven't maybe learned quite a lot, that really sounds so contradictory, doesn't it? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. But apparently James was convinced that temptation could be a good thing. Yet the thought is in total conflict with all the painful experiences that we've suffered in meeting with temptation. So when we start out here, when we start out here, let's first see what the word temptation means. Now Thayer defines it in Thayer's dictionary. He defines it this way. He says temptation it's the trial of man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, constancy. That's the first way that he defines it. So you have that area. And then he defines it as an enticement to sin, temptation, whether rising from the desires or from outward circumstances. So there can be two types of temptation. But, you, you know, that can be kind of hard to comprehend. You know, the English language isn't the, the best at describing things. And you look at the Hebrew language and the Greek and very specific. So let's go to the Greek word that James is using there. And he uses the word parasmos for temptations. It's the Greek word parasmos. And it means tests, trials, afflictions, troubles. But it, he's, the English translation, it, it, it can mean enticements to sin. But the word parasmos includes far more than the word temptations, I think, um, that we find in the English language. But it includes such afflictions as sickness, persecution, uh, poverty, calamity, you know, trials, whether expressly 
those trials are designed by Satan to tempt someone to sin or only to annoy and harass someone. And that's always a test for somebody who's following Christ, aren't they? But James says that the Christian may expect temptations periodically. This is what he's saying. And when he says to fall into temptations, he simply means that we're going to encounter them. And when we encounter them, I mean, it's not something that you necessarily uh, are expecting, right? You're not searching them out, <laughs> right? They're usually unsought, unexpected, and they're unwelcome <laughs> for the most part unless you understand the purpose of them. And that's what we're, we're trying to get to today. What is the purpose? What is temptation? Is it a sin? What's the purpose of it? I think James is talking more in these verses right here about trials than an enticement to sin. But if we really think about that, trials can be an enticement to sin, can they not? But we certainly need to understand that there are some redeeming features about temptation. Being tempted proves that, for one thing, we have moral insight. No one can be tempted unless there are meaningful choices to be made. Issues of right and wrong will have had to have been clearly distinguished, right? A person must have a consciousness, you see, of good and evil in order to be tempted to sin. Remember, Paul said in Romans 5.13, he said, Sin is not imputed when there is no law. So being tempted certainly implies that you're seeing the issues correctly for the most part, right? But now comes the most crucial question, I think, and it's, it's after we recognize uh, the, the true situation before us, how do we find the power to choose the good over the evil? And that gets to the crux of our question, our original question, is temptation a sin? Now Paul... He sensed the urgency uh, of this question when he wrote his first letter to the uh, Corinthian church. And there was no question with them about right and wrong. They understood what was right and what was wrong. And notice what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. And many of you know this. And it's an encouragement to us to, to know this. Paul said, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So the apostle warned against making an exception of ourselves. That's what he was doing here with the Corinthian church, the members there. It's easy for us, it seems to be easy, you know, it's easy for us to feel that no one else has ever had to face the enemy in the same way that we have to. Why am I going through this? Nobody else goes through this, right? Well, the Corinthians were not to think that the conditions under which they were expected to live faithful lives and following Jesus were exceptional, that they had difficulties to meet that were just peculiar to them, see? Their trials and temptations were no different from those experienced by men all over the world. And this is what Paul was saying to them. He's saying that they weren't alone in the experiences that they were going through. This isn't unique, right? The word says that there's nothing new under the sun. No matter what we suffer, the very same temptation has been you know, has come upon millions of others long before we were ever born. Oh, we like to consider our situation different from all others, though, don't we? And this kind of thinking, uh, it provides a very clever rationalization just in case we lose the battle, right? And we yield to the temptation. We kind of have given ourselves an out, haven't we? If our case is so different, well, see, God can't judge us as strictly as others who've had a much easier test, right? 
it seems like, friends, that, that we must constantly remind ourselves uh, that this has been the psychology of Satan for over 6,000 years. All he tried to do in the wilderness, that wilderness of temptation, uh, was to convince Jesus that he was different. That's what he was trying to do there. He was trying to, to convince Jesus that he was a special case like no other. And the sad truth is that many uh, people believe just what the devil was dishing up at that time to Jesus. That Jesus was not like us. See, Every one of the three approaches that Satan used against Christ was based on the idea that the Son of God he could do things that no one else could do. He could turn stones into bread. Or he could jump off the pinnacle without being hurt. No other human being could do that, right? It's because you're different, Jesus. You're different. And we're going to take a closer look at that battle in the wilderness in the next few studies. Uh, get more into it there. But I just want to touch upon that. That's one of the things that, that Satan does. He comes to us he says, you're different. You're going through a different experience that nobody has ever experienced before. And by looking at the, this battle in the wilderness, um, I hope that we, we come away with a greater understanding of what Jesus accomplished, as well as uncovering just how subtle and, and seductive Satan is in tempting us to sin. Because knowing this, there's a reason it's included in God's Word, right? It's for our understanding. And so having this knowledge is going to help us to overcome the devil. And so we'll get to that in the next few studies. Now, what is the purpose of temptation? Paul said, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. That's what he said. And that's rather reassuring and comforting, isn't it, to know that? God's not going to break us. He's not going to allow temptation to overtake us and just completely break us. But why should he allow agonizing conflicts uh, to overwhelm his people. Why allow it? Why not simply just remove all temptation? There's got to be a purpose for it, right? Well, if we go back to James, James chapter 1, I think we find our answer. James 1, verses 2 to 4. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, this is verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Temptation provides an opportunity for each one of us for spiritual victory and growth in Jesus Christ. It's not a disgrace to be tempted. If there are no battles... There can be no victories, right? Neither can there be nobility of character. Nothing will change except we will be lost. Because remember, we talked about it earlier, a change has to take place. Change has to take place in our life. And if there is no change in our life, we're going to be eternally lost, friends. Let me share this with you. It's from the book In Heavenly Places, page uh, 24, in Heavenly Places, page 24. She says, Temptation is allowed to come upon us to discover the character we possess and to improve our defects. So if you're wondering, why am I going through this? Step back, step, uh, step back for a second and think how God looks at us. God always has our best interest at heart. Friends, when I came to understand that, I appreciated God so much more and my heart completely melted and it's His. He has my best interest at heart. So even though I may be going through some kind of trial, I realize that God's in control. He's in control. And there's a reason this is happening. And as she says, it's allowed to come upon us to discover the character we possess, what's our current position, see, and to improve our defects. 
It's to show us where we are in our character formation and to educate us in our need. I mean, untried goodness may be no goodness at all, right? Think of this. I could place myself in a cave somewhere and not commit an outward sin for a whole week simply because I would have no contact with any other person. I'm by myself. Right? I'm in a cave. Would that week prove me to be a virtuous person? Not at all. Christianity is not merely the absence of wrong behavior in our life, friends. It has to do with an aggressive practice of right behavior as well. The same apostle, James, he said in, in chapter 4 and verse 17, he said, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The person who avoids all temptation by avoiding contact with all people, well, they might not do any harm, but neither do they do any good, and that could lead to sin, see? Paul said that God will make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it, which tells us that we will be bearing it. There is strength available to us to bear it. But does this mean uh, there will always be an easy road out of temptation? Some people think so. No. It just means that in every moral trial, God will provide us an alternative. Again, so we have a choice. There will always be two paths that lead out of each temptation. One is going to be the path of evil, and we're going to sin. The other is going to be a path of good when by the grace of Jesus we make a right choice and we do the right thing. You see, what Paul's telling us here, he's saying that we're being drawn in two directions every time we're tempted. At the same time we are tempted to anger, we also uh, uh, may be being tempted to self-control, see? And when we are tempted to be dishonest, we are also tempted to use integrity. There's a choice there's a story I always remember uh, about a little boy. He was standing in a store, and he had his hand in an apple, apple barrel. Now, this kind of ages me, because I remember when they had cracker barrels, and they had apple barrels. <laughs> and so he had his hand in the apple barrel, and he was caressing that beautiful ripened fruit, you know. And, and the, the storekeeper was watching him. And finally, he approached the boy, and he said, Are you trying to steal my apples? And the boy answered quickly, no, sir, I'm trying not to. <laughs> and so we can understand, I think, what he meant in his reply, can't we? All of us have struggled with those two voices, you know, and those two choices. Should I do it? Should I not do it? What am I going to do? Now, let's look toward the end of these two paths, which lead out of each temptation experience that we go through. The temptation that makes one character noble by not consenting to it will make another character uh, mean and dishonorable, see? Because they've given way to it. This law of human nature decrees that we can never be the same then after every temptation. I mean, think it through. Every time we're tempted, there's going to be a change. There's going to be a change in us, depending on what our choice is. We'll either get the victory and we'll gain strength. We'll be stronger for the next temptation we run into down the road or we're going to yield. And when we yield, we become weaker for the next one we face. And so our character then, it's built, it's either built up or it's, it's torn down depending on the choice that we make. Well, does this mean we should seek temptation? Some people think that. I've run into a few. They think, well, we should because victory can do so much good for us should we go searching for an opportunity to engage the enemy. And there are people that do this. You know? But I got asked, did Jesus look for such things to prove that he could overcome the devil? Did Jesus go looking for a fight? Didn't Satan tempt Jesus to do that very thing? 
to be presumptuous? If temptation can be such a glorious opportunity to develop character, why not pray, lead us into temptation, <laughs> All right? instead of lead us not into temptation? I mean, what's wrong with that kind of reasoning? We who possess freedom of choice, friends, we should pray that we would not misuse it by placing ourselves in circumstances that might test us beyond our strength. You see, fire controlled in the wood stove, well, that's one thing. That's good. That's great. But it's not very good if it's out of control in your living room. You're playing with fire, right? The fact is that we all too often misjudge our own powers or lack thereof, right? We, we don't understand our own strengths and we don't understand our own weaknesses. And for this reason, no one is justified in deliberately seeking for uh, a test or a trial or a temptation. We need to remember who our enemy is and he's so much more powerful than we are. We have no promise of deliverance under those kinds of circumstances because we're not acting upon faith, friends. We are being presumptuous and that's going to get us in trouble. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 that the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. The Lord knows how to do it. And God promises in Revelation 3 and verse 10, He says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. And what it means is, He will give us the strength to bear it. And that's what Paul was talking about. So God's the only one who's qualified to arrange the circumstances of our tests and... He's the only one qualified to help us in overcoming them. Because always remember, friends, God has our best interest at heart at all times. That's what love is, isn't it? Now, it's true, and we each know this, if we look at ourselves honestly, every one of us has vulnerable points of weakness in our characters. It's also true that there are special moments of time in which we are most liable to be overcome by the enemy. There's a reason that Jesus went out, was moved by the Holy Spirit to go out into the wilderness after 40 days of fasting. Wouldn't you say he was at probably the weakest point a human being could be in? Well, of course, he had to be. So that he could reach the weakest person, see? And overcome sin for them. But we all have these weaknesses, and there are times as well that are involved when we're more li liable to be overcome. And Satan is well acquainted with that very moment when our resistance will be the lowest, and he also understands our individual weakness. And we can be sure that his strongest attack against us will come in our weakest moment at the weakest point in our character. He has a better opportunity of causing us to fail and fall for temptation at that point. We are only as strong as we are in our weakest moment of our life, friends. Our character is only as strong as its weak, weakest link. That's what... Uh, you know, the old saying about a chain. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so those facts should convince us that we should never deliberately go and expose ourselves to tests in order to build character. We will be building character, but it may be in the wrong direction. So God must measure the temptations to our personal need and our strength, and only He knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so he must constantly control the force of those circumstances that, that try our faith and our experience. And that is what will happen when we consistently give our will to him. We talked about a matter of uh, will and conscience. We talked about the will. So um, we give our will to him so that what? So that he can will and do according to his good pleasure. See? Another interesting fact about temptation is that it always attacks the mind first. Doesn't that make sense? 
considering what we've learned so far about you know the sin issue that sin begins in the mind right starts in our head Jesus said in Mark 7 verses 21 to 23 He said for from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications murders thefts covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Well, you look at that list, I think it, every category of evil is included. Don't you? It's included in this list of sins that come from the heart. In Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul described lust as fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. In the Greek text, uh, more accurately, it says desires of the thoughts. That's interesting, isn't it? We talk about desires, desires of the thoughts. But right here, when we talk about this, I want to make some very careful distinctions. And there is some distinctions here when we talk about desires. It's very important to understand that desire in itself is not wrong. God has actually placed certain powerful appetites and propensities within our human nature. There's nothing uh, wrong with these drives as long as they are properly controlled and properly directed. This includes ambition, temper, sex, every other basic nature. Wrong comes in only one way. Remember our, our Bible definition of sin. What is it? Transgression of the law. Transgression of the law right? Wrong comes in only one way, and that's when desire oversteps the bounds and seeks gratification outside the will of God, outside the law. And that's what Paul's talking about. That's why it turns to lust. See, Every day we're confronted, friends. We're confronted with pictures, with books, with words, with music, with food, etc. that are exciting. And, and they appeal to our nature. They appeal to our mind. It's through these emotional stimulants that the mind is often presented with unholy thoughts and desires. The temptation to lust then is present, but that's not sin. As long as those desires are not gratified or fulfilled, they are not wrong. Now there's some we God what God's going to do is He's He's in the process of sanctification of changing the desires. Okay. Satan can whisper into our mind. We went through and, and looked at uh, um, spiritual possession and, and we looked at some of these, these things. Satan can whisper things into our mind. They pop into our mind. That's not something that just arose from ourselves. Okay? But they're not wrong unless it goes over the bounds. Notice how James describes the process. We go back to James chapter 1. This time we look at verses 14 and 15. He said, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, see that? When lust conceives, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, well, what's the result? He says it bringeth forth death. So, maybe look at it like this. Temptation is like a seed, temptation to do wrong. Is like a seed that Satan tries to plant in your mind. It's not sin, but the seed of sin. Satan is trying to persuade our carnal heart to seek pleasures of sin for a season, but we can exercise our educated conscience that's been educated by God, right? And by God's grace, refuse the seed. So the seed that he tried to plant in our mind finds no fertile ground to germinate into the fruit of sin. And this is how Jesus uh, himself overcame temptation. 
But if that seed is allowed to mingle with the carnal nature, if it is dwelt upon, it may lead to being acted upon, and it will produce an inevitable harvest of sin, friends, and finally death. And that's what James is talking about. Our only protection is to set a guard before all the avenues of the soul whereby we test every entering thought. And friends, that's possible. By the grace and strength of Christ, every evil desire can be recognized and sifted out so that it has no opportunity. It won't even linger in our mind to become a catalyst of lust and of sin. But, can human beings, even in concert with Christ, actually conquer the temptation to harbor these impure thoughts? Can we have that kind of control? Well, the Bible says that we can. Now, again, not of ourselves. There is a change that has to be made. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Notice what he says, verse 5. Casting down imaginations, right? And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How is such total victory possible? Is it accomplished through prayer, faith, or personal effort? Well, friends, there's only one way. Basically, this kind of deliverance comes only through uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in one's heart and mind. There is not strength enough in the flesh to overcome one evil desire. We can try to hit God's mark, but without the Holy Spirit in our life, we're always going to fall short of it. Every single time. And so, victory over temptation is not obtained without our strong cooperation and action with God. You see, some people think they have a misunderstanding of what righteousness by faith is. They go to the extreme of everything that you do is by faith. There's no work involved, no process of sanctification. You've got to be very careful. And we, we'll talk about this at some time, justification and sanctification. People are today, most Christians today, they think this justification is what's saved. Yeah, sanctification, that process, that's nice, but it's not needed to be to, to, for salvation. And that's straight from the devil, friends. That's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. You see, Paul said in Philippians 2 verse 12, he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So we cooperate with God, see. Again, that gets back to the conscience and educating the conscience so that the will can make the right choice, see, by the grace of God. That has to do with uh, this process, this cooperation. God doesn't work miracles, friends, to deliver those who don't use their own God-given power to avoid evil. we got to guard the avenues of our mind. We must work with God, see, and not against Him. Again, let's not be presumptuous. If you want to overcome the evil of of alcohol, you don't go to the liquor store every Friday. Right? you got to stop it. Again, we're brought back to the question of inviting temptation. How far should we go in protecting ourselves from the vulnerability of sin? And Jesus laid it all out for us. He, he actually, he laid down a very clear principle in the Sermon uh, on the Mount. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, and we look at verses 29 and 30, remember what Jesus said here? He said, if thy right eye offend thee, what's he say to do? 
he says, pluck it out, right? Pluck it out, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And then in verse 30, he says, if thy right hand offend thee, what do you do? Cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into, into hell. So obviously, uh, Jesus was not talking about the literal eye <laughs> or the literal hand, right? I mean, somebody could cut off most all of their body and still be as wicked as ever, right? And his name would be Bob. Just to let you know. Christ was talking about the occupation of your hand. And he was talking about what your eye focuses on. Okay? If we find ourselves in a physical situation that opens a door to temptation and sin, well, his counsel is to cut it off. He's saying that any, uh, uh, any radical means, really, should be used to avoid situations that might overwhelm us into choosing sin. If we find ourselves looking at some scene that's likely to, to introduce sinful thoughts or actions, Jesus is saying that we need to shut that view away from our sight. And usually by any righteous means as possible. You know, I've had people ask me, you know, would Jesus ask us to deny ourselves some good thing just because a small amount maybe of mind pollution might be involved? Well, I think it's much better to lead what the world calls a narrow-minded existence, you know, than to lead a so-called full life and lose your soul. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so what I'm really really saying is that even with a spiritual mind, we need to follow the basic principles of victory over temptation. There are places to be avoided if we want to have total victory. There are devotional requirements if we would be, uh, we want to be in harmony with Jesus. So we have avenues to our mind and they have to be guarded. We have to guard the avenues if we want to defeat sin at its very beginning because remember, it starts in our mind. I've also seen at times too, I've had this experience. I've seen a person, uh, I've seen people overcome in the area where they feel like they're spiritually the strongest. Have you ever been a witness to that? Maybe that's happened to you. How does that happen? Well, Satan will attack, he will attack where we have no guard. And why don't we have a guard there? Because we feel that we don't need one there. Right? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, he said, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I mean, let's think about some of the better known people in the Bible who even today we... We, we kind of hold them in high regard. But yet they fell, didn't they? I mean, there's no inspired explanation given as to how Moses could sub succumb to impatience or anger. I mean, the Bible presents him as the meekest man who ever lived. I mean, you might, if you contemplate it, you might think, uh, um, well, he might yield to some other temptations, but surely not to the, to the passion of anger. Yet that's exactly the sin that shut Moses out of the promised land. He smote the rock in anger instead of speaking to it as God commanded. You can read about that in Numbers 20. What about Elijah? I mean, think of Elijah. His great strength was courage, you would think. Everything you read, this man was full of courage. He withstood single-handedly, friends, all the entrenched forces of Baal on Mount Carmel. I mean, with incredible boldness, he challenged anyone who deviated from the path of full obedience to the Creator God. Yet immediately after that contest, 
a successful contest, by the way, you know, with the prophets of Baal, he fled like a coward from the threats of Queen Jezebel. It kind of just makes us go, wow, how is that even possible? I mean, Abraham, he was distinguished by his total trust in God. He is called the father of the faithful. Yet he lied to the king of Egypt out of fear that his wife would be taken from him. Some of these things we go, how is that even possible? These great Bible characters demonstrate, friends, I think dramatically, how Satan attacks the place in our lives where there is a lack of, of alertness. Over and over and over, Jesus tells us to watch and pray, to be sober, be on alert. So no one should think that they're immune to Satan's attacks because of some self-evident virtue, you know, we think we possess. There's another great truth about temptation which should bring courage to all of us. Uh, and it's that many temptations will cease to trouble us as we make good choices or habit. Just as our brain is programmed to do wrong by a constant yielding to compromise and defeat, it can be programmed for victory through right choices. But the conscious must be educated, right? It has to be educated by God and then consistently righteousness chosen by the will. Is it possible to uh, take the strength out of a particular temptation? Yes, it is. Thousands of people have established a pattern of devotion that they don't even consider certain temptations anymore. The, the temptation really no longer exists for them. It's not that they're overconfident, it's just you can't tempt them in that. For an example, quick example, it's not a temptation for me to stop worshiping on Sabbath and begin worshiping on Sunday. That's not a temptation for me. <laughs> you could try and try and try. It's not even a temptation. That will never happen. <laughs> it's just, that's, that's a part of that settling in of the truth that the prophet talks about. Um, the power to say no to temptations, though, friends, remember, is only, it's only possible through conversion. In Philippians 2 and verse 5, and I need to move along here, um, Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is the ultimate answer, really, to our original question, is temptation a sin? Uh, I mean, as well as how we are able to resist the temptation to sin. It's all about Jesus, see? The ultimate answer to the question, is temptation a sin, is answered by looking at Jesus. Jesus was a man like us. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 14 to 18. Let's read that. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Notice he didn't say Adam. He said, Abraham, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. The human nature of Christ felt the full force of temptation just like we do friends otherwise christ wouldn't have understood that terrific struggle of a poor sinner who's tempted and i mean mightily tempted to yield in sin let me share this with you it's from gospel workers page 441 it's beautiful she says trials and temptations may come but the child of God, whether minister or layman, knows that Jesus is his helper. Although we may be weak and helpless in ourselves, all the forces of heaven are at the command of the believing child of God, and the hosts of hell cannot make him depart from the right course if, 
There's that word. If he will cling to God by living faith, temptation is no sin. The sin is in yielding to temptation. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Again, it's by looking to Christ that answers our question. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ was tempted, friends, in all points like as we are. He actually suffered under temptation. How much Christ suffered in resisting temptation, well, friends, that's revealed in his wilderness, Gethsemane, and Golgotha experiences. In the first two cases, the temptation was so overwhelming that it seems he'd have died under the impact had not angels been sent to strengthen him. By successfully resisting temptation and patiently enduring suffering, Christ overcame the tempter. And we are now, in our battles, contending with a defeated foe. Because Christ's victory is our assurance of victory, friends. It is an ever-present source of comfort to know that Christ understands our sorrows. He understands our perplexities. He sympathizes with us. If Christ had not become man, the question might easily have arisen, how can we know that God loves and cares for us when he's never experienced you know, the trials that we encounter? He has, has never been poor or forsaken and has never known what it is to be alone and face an unknown future. I mean, he asks us to be faithful to death, but has he ever faced the issues we face? If he were one of us and one with us, he would know how hard it is to meet certain trials. But friends, if he's never been human with the same hereditary tendencies we have, does he really know all our sorrows? And can he sympathize with us when we stray? Well, to this the answer is that God does know. <laughs> and that it was not for his sake, but for ours, that Jesus became poor. It was not for his sake, but for ours, that Jesus suffered and died. We needed the demonstration that Christ came to give, or we would never have known the deep love of God for suffering humanity. Besides, we would never have known the suffering that sin has brought to the heart of our Heavenly Father. Temptation, friends, loses its power when Jesus enters our life. Jesus offers each one of us the victory that he won over Satan in the flesh. We might be suspicious of this gift had he not overcome in the same human nature we possess. But now he wants to enter your life and live out the same victory in you day after day. You see, friends, sin loses its appeal for those who are in love with Christ and the ones who have made a decision to serve him instead of themselves. And this is the way of escape that is promised to those who will receive it. Jesus simply passes on to his spiritual children the total victory that he won over the devil while living here in human flesh. And under this power, the Christian uses his surrendered will to choose a lifestyle that avoids the snares of temptation. And both factors... Friends, both factors are very important in winning victory. Having Christ in the heart and avoiding presumptuous situations and temptations. Let me share this with you as I close. It's from the book Maranatha, page 225. Through the plan of redemption, God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait and resisting every temptation 
however strong. The strongest temptation is no excuse for sin. However great the pressure brought to bear upon the soul, transgression is our own act. It is not in the power of earth or hell to compel anyone to sin. The will must consent, the heart must yield, or passion cannot overbear reason, nor iniquity triumph over righteousness. If you will stand under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, faithfully doing his service, you need never yield to temptation. For one stands by your side who is able to keep you from falling. We need not retain one sinful propensity. As we partake of the divine nature, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong are cut away from the character, and we are made a living power for good. Ever learning of the divine teacher, daily partaking of his nature, we cooperate with God in overcoming Satan's temptation. God works and man works that man may be one with Christ as Christ is one with God. Then we sit together with Christ in heavenly places. The mind rests with peace and assurance in Jesus. Let's enter into that rest, my friends. Let us enter into that rest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very, very much for Jesus. We thank you that your holy word has been protected through the, the ages so that we may read and understand about you, about Christ, about righteous principles, about the plan of salvation and how to overcome temptation. And also that temptation in itself is not sin. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We, we still learn every time we open your word, every time we come to you in prayer, we learn more and more about what Christ has done for us. Oh, what love. What love for humanity. Now, Father, we thank you for that most precious gift. And we humbly pray that you will forgive us our sins. Give us of that Holy Spirit and help us to be the overcomers. Looking to Jesus always as our example. That's our prayers. We pray it in his name. Amen.